Okay, so I have a confession to make. I don't know how to ride a bicycle. I mean, I just don't get the whole balance thing, you know? In my high school years, when I wanted to learn to fly a plane through a school youth flying program, my mother said, no. You don't know how to ride a bicycle, you won't be able to fly a plane. It's all about balance. A few years later, as a late teen, I wanted to learn to ride a motorbike. And my mother's response again was, no. You don't know how to ride a bicycle, you can't ride a motorbike. I injured my knee snowboarding once. And her response, it's because you don't know how to ride a bicycle. Now I got tired of people telling me what I could and could not do. So I thought, I'm going to challenge myself and prove to everybody that I can indeed do whatever I set out to do. So I finally decided, j just two months ago, to learn wakeboarding. Now I know what all of you are thinking. I don't know how to ride a bicycle, I won't be able to wakeboard. But I was determined to prove that it could be done. So as I strapped my boots onto my feet in, on the board and got into the water, I thought to myself, this is it. There's no turning back. The first few times as the boat started to move, I would fall flat on my face in the water. But by the sixth time, I was determined. And as the boat started to move, as the rope started to pull me, as the board was being lifted by the waves from underneath, I thought to myself, Finally, but before I could think any further, my feet and board caught a wave and flew in one direction while my body flailed in another direction. The result was a fractured ankle and I was taken to hospital that same day. Of course, when my mother visited me in hospital, the first thing she said was, it's because you don't know how to ride a bicycle. But I had a surgical fixation the next day and was discharged the morning after that. I was in and out of hospital in under 48 hours because I was fortunate to have excellent access to healthcare. But as I lay in hospital bed recovering post-broken ankle, I couldn't help but think that others around the world were not so fortunate, that something else in this world was truly broken, something that has bothered me often enough. I thought back to December 26, 2004, when many people around the world were recovering from their Christmas festivities, when a massive 9.1 magnitude earthquake hit the Indian Ocean floor, resulting in a devastating tsunami that killed nearly a quarter of a million people in a single day in the countries and islands surrounding the Indian Ocean. The Boxing Day Tsunami. It was shocking and an utter tragedy. The world responded rapidly with an outpouring of financial donations, relief supplies and equipment. There were those too who volunteered much needed relief services in the immediate aftermath. But the tragedy didn't end in that one day, nor in the weeks to months after the event. The tragedy continued to affect lives many years after the world stopped caring even though the tsunami had shed light on communities of people that already before the event were living in dire conditions without proper access to basic health care. The tsunami made this exponentially worse and tipped many more under the poverty line. And years later, there was still hardly access to health care for many communities. But by then, the interest of most people around the world was focused on newer events, to the sufferers of the tsunami, it was as if the world just watched. Five years after the tsunami, I joined a team to provide medical relief to villagers in Padang, Indonesia, who are still suffering the effects of a post-tsunami world. I witnessed firsthand the continual struggle of people living day by day, without proper access to healthcare for even their basic needs. In stark contrast, we volunteers had come from countries that had many clinics every few kilometers. We had set up clinic near an isolated village. And on the last day, one of the patients who had hobbled to us with a makeshift walking stick and a deformed lower leg 
was a 58-year-old farmer who had slipped in his field a few days prior. He had not sought medical treatment because the nearest hospital was many, many kilometers away and he did not have the financial means for the journey. Even without an x-ray, it was apparent that his lower leg was broken and would require surgery. I advised him he needed to go to a hospital immediately to avoid the risk of permanent disability. He adamantly refused. He was just not going. He was afraid the cost of the journey and hospitalization would be too much for him to bear. With the limited resources that we had, I could only treat him with a splint and painkillers. His non-surgical treatment, which was not uncommon in such low-resource settings, would possibly lead to lifelong disability. In plain contrast, after my broken ankle, I was walking near normal in six weeks. We left that same night. There was little more that I could do for him. I felt completely helpless. The 2010 earthquake in Haiti was no different. And again, I went with a team to provide medical relief. And again, the inequity was stark. A one-year-old baby was brought to us with a bout of severe diarrheal disease. She had sunken eyes, a dry lips and tongue, and was lethargic. Her veins were so tiny from her severe dehydration that we struggled to put an intravenous drip for her and start her on fluids. We finally managed to, on a neck vein, started her on fluids and transferred her to the nearby US Navy floating hospital. She was fortunate. But thousands others were not, because healthcare just couldn't reach them. Once again, I felt completely helpless with lack of resources. Once again, people started losing interest. And once again, the world just watched. Now, in many low- and middle-income countries, the continuing tragedy is that the poorest and most vulnerable have got inadequate access to quality healthcare. People are dying unnecessarily of diseases that can and should have been treated easily. This is not about inequality. This is about inequity. Justice is broken. These tragedies expose these inequities for the whole world to see. But we did little about it, perhaps because we just did not know how. As I continued lying in bed thinking about broken ankles and broken justice, I recalled how I had developed an interest in medical technology, or medtech, using innovative technological or engineering solutions to solve all sorts of traditional medical problems. A few years ago, I had come across a company that claimed to be able to perform an array of blood tests rapidly with just a single drop of blood. Theranos. Wow. Imagine the number of lives this technology could improve. And this could extend to low-resource settings. It unfortunately turned out to be fraudulent. But when I had realized the potential of its impact, I had seen the power that MedTech truly could have. Could medical technology offer a solution to the problems I had seen? Now, it would seem somewhat intuitive that our recent era of rapid innovation of medical technology could do so with the potential for cheaper, better, faster diagnostics and treatments of disease with robotics, 3D printed organs, AI and precision medicine, devices, gene editing technology. Our own lives too have improved with the advent of wearable technologies, giving us real-time feedback of our health status. But who are these solutions truly made for? Who are those that can afford these solutions? Without careful purpose, these solutions can actually widen the gap. The same gap that all these tragedies had exposed. The same gap that many people were closing their eyes to because it just didn't affect them. The gap of health inequity. Fast forward, December 2019. A new virus had spread across the globe to nearly every single country. Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, or coronavirus as we know it, had spread, well, virally. We in Singapore were lucky. Early in the course of the disease, I went to work every day with the fear of bringing back an infection to my loved ones. 
but knowing that with proper and available personal protective equipment and rigorous protocols, the, my risk of infection was decreased, my fears diminished. However, many people around the world were not so lucky. Economies were toppled, healthcare systems were challenged, people, even healthcare workers and politicians and leaders of countries were being infected by a tiny virus that knew no boundaries, no socioeconomic class, no creed, nor color. And now the world sat up. We could no longer just watch because COVID-19 is affecting nearly every single one of us. Yet even here, the inequities are becoming ever clearer. Richer countries are focusing on their own survival, while the gap with the smaller countries and poorer countries of the developing world were continuing to widen. Much of the progress that some of these countries had made in terms of health access was set back years in just a matter of weeks to months by a tiny particle not even visible to the naked eye. Yes, this is a global battle. But although we are all in the same fight, the harsh reality is that some are armed with tanks and artillery, while others with simple bows and arrows. In our modern world, medical technology has the ability to level this battlefield, to really improve health access and to truly democratize healthcare, if done purposefully. This means the intentional design of technologies and solutions aimed at lower resource settings. This means thoroughly evaluating the social implications and consequences of our technological solutions. This means a rethink of the entire concept of medtech, and instead of aiming to be the next biggest exit, focusing instead on how many lives can be saved or improved. But how do we do this? How do we innovate with purpose? Let me leave you with three Ps. Problem. Think first of the problem specific to a low resource setting. Person. When you have identified the problem in a low resource setting, think of the unique challenges that a person with this problem would face. Passion. You don't need to be a doctor or an engineer. You just need to have a passion to innovate with purpose. Let me give you a few examples. There are over 20 million people around the world with limb amputations as a result of trauma from natural disasters, accidents, and war. A limb prosthesis costs anywhere from 6,000 to 100,000 US dollars, depending on the level of sophistication. A team from Stanford delved deep into this problem and created an innovative knee joint that addressed the unique needs of developing world amputees who needed a highly durable, strong performance, yet simple, light and affordable prosthesis. Their product costs 40 US dollars. They had identified a need in a low resource setting and understood the unique challenges that developing world amputees would face. Moving over to India, a school dropout who had become an odd job laborer had realized his wife was collecting old rags and newspapers to use during her menstrual cycle, as conventional sanitary pads were too expensive. He developed a low-cost sanitary pad-making machine, despite being ridiculed for dealing with such a taboo subject. But by understanding the unique challenges that women face in such situations, not only did the affordable sanitary pads allow many women to continue earning their livelihood during their menstrual cycles, the machines too created jobs for many women. These are just some examples of how MedTech can improve health access and truly democratize healthcare. And anyone can realize this value, whether you're a Stanford team or a school dropout. Anyone with the passion and heart to solve problems of health inequity can do so, but innovate purposefully, innovate intentionally, innovate for social impact. In a world reimagined, our world, we can no longer just watch. We urgently need to heal the fractures of our world's broken health delivery system. And to do so, you don't need to know how to ride a bicycle. <laughs>